I'll be reacting to Kayla Kasuga's video on why my $19,000 nose job wasn't worth it. Recovery, photos, and experience. As you guys know, I'm double board certified, head and neck surgery, facial plastic surgery, and hair restoration. You know, I do a lot of rhinoplasty surgery, both for my practice and also for the VA hospital here in New York. What is up, guys? Welcome back to my channel. It's been a year since I had a rhinoplasty. And you know, it takes about a year for most of the swelling to subside. For pain patients with thicker skin it's gonna take longer than for patients with thinner skin and sometimes it can take beyond the year. What was the experience like? Well, I didn't have the best experience only because I had an allergic reaction to my medication. I'm allergic to a lot of like antibiotics. I ended up finding out that I was allergic to this new antibiotic that I thought I wasn't allergic to. I didn't have the best experience. However, like after I got the hospital like three days later, I would personally say that the whole entire thing is just very uncomfortable. It doesn't hurt whatsoever. I had um, rib cartilage removed to build like my nose bridge and then I also had fascia removed. It's not too common to go with rib cartilage for a primary rhinoplasty unless her nose was much flatter to begin with and she was looking to really build out projection. Usually there's enough cartilage within the nose or some ear cartilage to do a primary rhinoplasty but again it depends where exactly she started. They weren't painful like I couldn't feel it. And the fascia that, that she's talking about was most likely used to take the cartilage from the rib that was most likely diced up. We call this a Turkish delight type of graft. So the cartilage get, gets diced up and then the fascia gets wrapped around all of that. And then that gets inserted as basically like a little implant into the bridge of the nose for increased projection. So that's most likely what um, she had. Very uncomfortable was like when I like would sneeze or laugh, you could just like feel like the rib and it just didn't feel nice. And then like I hated sleeping like up like this. Like I, I'm a side sleeper. So I feel like that was really uncomfortable too and then not being able to breathe out your nose for like the first week because you have like those little things like stuck up in your nose it wasn't the best and i probably wouldn't want to go through that again rib cartilage is definitely a more painful experience to go through when it comes to just general rhinoplasty healing it's a lot more uncomfortable than just getting the nose worked on i personally don't like to do autologous rib harvesting for different reasons there's additional donor site morbidity there are certain risks like pneumothorax hemothorax which are not common Common, but you can actually deflate an entire lung if that were to happen if you were to get that type of uh, puncture again that's not too common but it, but it can happen and then all the pain and discomfort of this other site also autologous rib has a tendency to warp so it kind of can take on a more curved shape than the way that you insert the cartilage so you have to be mindful of that when placing solid grafts into the nose what was the hardest part of recovery I would say the hardest part of recovery is just you know kind of trusting the the process waiting for the swelling to go down because I can promise you once you get your cast off your nose is gonna look like that a year later it's gonna look so different I'm gonna put like video clips of me like from the beginning of the month to the end of the month and you can just see like the big difference of my nose in those videos you can see how like defined and unnatural it looks and it's just like super pointy I think that's like the hardest part of recovery is just trying to like trust the process just throwing up a lot of photos I'll have to kind of slow it down a little bit here but let me see what else she has to say how long did it take for your nose to heal and has the swelling gone down it's been like one year post-op my nose is still swollen on the tip area just by the touch of it like my nose is like hard it's because i have like a cartilage like right here which i never used to have my nose used to have like no support mm, okay so she's putting up her original uh, nose here what i'm seeing here is that she has a decent amount of bridge projection um actually and she does have um, a, a, a hump a dorsal hump and she has what seems to be kind of a poorly supported nasal tip and that's causing some ptosis where the tip of the nose kind of droops down a bit and so you can see that her nasolabial angle this angle right here is at about 90 degrees in a female nose you want it to be closer to 95 98 degrees instead of a 90 degree angle so I can see like why she wanted um, certain changes done would I have gone to a rib graft or needed rib to work on this nose I would say no but it also depends on exactly what her goals were what she wanted to achieve what she told the surgeon but in situations like these I generally would avoid needing any additional source of cartilage beyond just what's in the septum and what we could potentially get from harvesting from an ear I wouldn't say that my swelling has gone down 100% I feel like it's gone down like 
90%. And the tip is, is where the swelling is gonna linger the longest and it's gonna take the longest to resolve. Thicker skin as well. Like I said, alluding to what I said earlier, thicker skin, um, which she does have. And, and the way to judge if someone has thicker or thinner skin, one good way to do it is to actually look at the um, size of the ala. These are the, the mounds on the sides of the nose. They don't contain cartilage. It's like fibro fatty tissue. It's different for everyone, which is so annoying sometimes because like I've seen other people who got a rhinoplasty and once they got their cast off, they looked so perfect. Yeah, and, and, and that's largely because those are patients with much thinner skin. Those like reveals like, oh, oh my God, look at me. I'm one week out. I look amazing. That's almost always on thin skin patients. It's just different for everyone. Usually like European people, they have really thin skin. So like they heal quickly. The tip has gone down because it used to be like super pointy and like upward throughout the time it kept dropping, which I definitely loved. That was something I was scared of because once I got my cast off, I was like, this doesn't match me. I wouldn't say the swelling has gone down because it hasn't on the tip, but everywhere else, like the swelling has gone down. No matter what, your nose will like swell in, like one day and the next day it will be like not swollen. The swelling can fluctuate. It really can. A lot of times it's worse in the mornings than later on in the day because that's when we have the most amount of moisture in our bodies. Are you 100% happy with the results? I'm going to be 100% honest with you guys. I'm in like in between. Some days I'm like, oh, I love my nose. And then other days I'm just like, you know, it could have been better. Um, so there's like some things like I want to talk about like what happened like through my healing process Which I don't understand why my nose came out like this way So if you guys look at my own nose I have this little like bump on it and if you didn't watch like my rhinoplasty That's the dorsal hump or we sometimes call it a dorsal convexity And that just means that there's a little bit of, of an outpouching there very common and I have one for example It occurs at the junction between where the bones and the car cartilage meet uh, along the top or the bridge of, of your nose. Uh, so it's almost always a combination of some cartilage and some bone and both need to be addressed in order to take down that dorsal hump. That was the only like main concern. I mostly cared about like my side profile. Anyway, so throughout time when my nose was healing, it looked really good. Like it was straight. You couldn't see a hump. But then I think when I hit March, I believe, the hump started to show again, which I thought was very like concerning. And I would talk to my um, doctor and I would be like hey do you know what's going on like why is like this like you know happening I've been noticing like a lot of other things just to comment on on the bridge and why sometimes it looks pretty good and then all of a sudden you might start to notice that hey it looks like a little bump again one reason why that might happen is what's called a bony callus so you can get a little bit of bony overgrowth as that bone heals because the bone is filed down and sometimes um, you have this little kind of callus that forms and it can kind of create the illusion of another another little uh, bump there so that that's one reason why that could happen my nostrils are uneven and it slants to the left and there's this weird bump on the tip of my nose. You know, the nostrils are often uneven to begin with. A lot of patients don't really uh, hyperanalyze their nostrils before surgery, but they do after surgery. And it's good to go back to the original photos and point out that, hey, the nostrils were never the same. The nostrils are never the same for anybody, one side versus the other. And when you look at the, the left ala compared to the right ala, the left ala is her wider ala. And that also translates into how you know, the actual shape of the nostril. So the nostril, again, it's made up of the columella, it's made up of, of this ala rim, and it's made up of the, the actual lateral ala and the, and the sill, the nasal sill of the nose. So you can see that her left ala is definitely her wider, thicker ala. And again, that's because of natural asymmetry. So it'd be interesting to see her original nose from this angle and to really compare and contrast. I don't think the ala wall got any thicker from surgery. It, it doesn't do that. However, with certain other changes to the tip, you could see some additional um, nostril irregularities that can form. So first of all, the side profile of my nose, this hump right here, it never went away. I'm definitely seeing what she's talking about with this persistent dorsal convexity that you can see. The lower aspect of the dorsum was taken down, but there's a, an aspect higher up that really wasn't reduced enough surgically, and that's why you're seeing this still kind of convexity, this bumpy type of aspect to it. It's not as defined or as prominent as it was preoperatively, but there's still a segment that has 
not been sort of filed down or brought down to, to match up with the area above, which is closer to the radix of the nose, which is like the top part of the nose, and not in line with the, the lower dorsum, which is the lower bridge, which essentially feeds right into the tip of the nose. So this has been brought down, this is naturally in, and now you're still seeing some convexity there that hasn't been fully addressed. And then the tip has been augmented, right? Whether, I guess they use the rib cartilage to augment the tip. So they've projected the tip, they've raised the tip, it's not as droopy, but now it's more defined and you have more of a discrepancy then between the bridge and the tip because this kind of almost divot that's occurring. It's natural to have some degree of what's called a super tip break which is a little bit of depression right above the tip, but hers is more pronounced. And so as this breaks more, you're starting to kind of see that longer break feeding back into that convexity, which she doesn't like. To me, by the looks of it, it looks like it never got shaved down. I was told by my doctor that it was just swelling. And so I kind of just gave it more time. And then when I reached, I think like May or June, it was still there. Like it wasn't even like going down at all. And then the more the swelling has gone down, the more that hump got more noticeable. Um, and I was just told it was swelling and that I should get a steroid shot. I ended up getting a steroid shot on my nose and it did not help whatsoever. Steroids can sometimes work on the nose uh, in terms of reducing the swelling post-operatively, but you have to be careful because if the steroids are placed too close to the skin surface, you can actually get like a atrophy of the skin and even a divoting which becomes hard to fix I was told by my doctor that I should get a revision rhinoplasty usually like 30% of people end up getting like a minor like revision rhinoplasty so I was recommended to my doctor like hey we can do a revision rhinoplasty and we can shave down the little bridge yeah I mean 30% is a really high number in my practice it's definitely much much lower than that but you know it's not unheard of and revision rhinoplasty is always more challenging most doctors will will offer it for a significantly reduced price um, when it comes to revising our own work. But if you go to another doctor and you need a revision, usually that price is gonna be higher than doing the primary rhinoplasty with them. So that's just something to, to, um, to watch for. And I kind of just like thought there and I was like, do I really like wanna go through that again? Like, I don't hate my nose. Like, I prefer this nose than my old nose. It's just really upsetting because I paid a lot of money you know, to get my nose done. This has been something I've been wanting to do forever, and you guys know that. Like, I've done so much research. I wasn't gonna pay again to get my nose, like, fixed when, you know, that's the whole point of why I went in in the first place. I understand what she's saying. I mean, $19,000 is expensive. Um, it's a lot of money for anything, but, um, you know, for a procedure for sure. And I guess they were gonna charge her at least something for the revision, which is pretty common. I doubt it was gonna be another 19000 but even if you're just paying for operating room and, you know, anesthesia costs, you're looking at probably at least five, six, seven thousand dollars. So again, even more money. You know, the other thing to remember here is that all surgery has risks. And when you go in for surgery, you sign off on a lot of documents that specify what you know the different risks are. Not every doctor will talk to you about all the risks, but we have a form that people sign that really spells out a lot of the things that could potentially go wrong. And even in the best of hands, you know, the people who've written all the, the big textbooks on rhinoplasty, they've all, everyone's had some bad results, some results they're not happy with. You really have to kind of do this like risk benefit like analysis and figure out when you factor in the cost, the recovery time, sort of everything that goes at the potential for for problems, for poor aesthetic outcomes, for irregularities, for asymmetries, for deviations. You have to figure out with all those possibilities and all those expenses, is it worth potentially having a nicer nose? There's no right answer. This is not bad to the point where I like, I literally like am so insecure. It doesn't really bother me. It's just like, it's just upsetting because I get, I paid a good amount of money to get my nose done and it wasn't the results I wanted. So like one question was like, is there anything you would have done differently? I think it's just because of swelling, but like my tip is just like so far out, which that's like another thing I wasn't really happy about either. And then she also mentioned the firmness of her tip and that's most likely due to the rib cartilage. That creates a lot of firmness generally. If you use other parts like the septum or ear cartilage, you usually get a lot less firmness to the tip of your nose, which most people appreciate. When I smile, my nose like pops, like they're like it moves, like this piece right here, it like moves and you can hear it. Like, you know how when I pop my jaw, when I do like this, because I have TMJ? Well, when I smile, my nose piece, like this little cartilage right here, does the same thing. 
I'm pretty sure it's not supposed to do that. So that's a little weird as well. It seems like they place the graft into that area and usually that is suture secured in and generally heals in quite nicely. Uh, potentially there is some degree of shift from the graft and that could produce that type of sound. It's usually not dangerous. I can understand that it's a nuisance for sure. Was it worth the price? No, it was not worth the 19k that I paid. Recovery from any um, facial plastic surgery is known to be challenging because of the bruising, the swelling that's involved and it's in such an obvious place that it's very visible and it's a lot to go through so I, I understand you know that it wasn't easy for Kayla and it's not easy for for a lot of people a lot of what I do is just reassuring people in the early period that being said if something looks like a problem it needs to be addressed and not just you know kind of disregarded. No matter what you do, you will always find something that you don't like about yourself. I think there's other ways you can love yourself without having to go under the knife. I'm not trying to make this video to stop anyone getting a rhinoplasty. I just want people to just be a little bit more open-minded that this is what comes with it as well because I feel like no one talks about that. So the more I've grown, the more I've come to a realization about a lot of things and I wish I knew that before. If you don't love yourself in the inside, you're never going to love yourself in the outside. Well said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't recommend people get plastic surgery to then love themselves more. The best reason to get plastic surgery is that there's a kind of a more specific targeted kind of issue that is perceived and there's a specific reason or something that you've thought about for a long time. I think the reason in some ways does matter. Always do it for yourself and not for other people. Definitely plastic surgery can lead to improved self-confidence. It can lead to others perceiving you in a very different light. Hopefully, you know, for the better if the surgery is done naturally and, and done properly and you heal well. But of course it has its downsides. Of course it's not for everyone. It's not gonna help you like with some internal self fulfillment fulfillment and, and, and deeper kind of um, subject matters. I mean, I think it starts with being at least somewhat of a confident enough person, positive person, and then hopefully having certain plastic surgeries if you want them, just kind of enhance enhance things or turn back the clock a bit for those types of reasons. Thank you, Kayla, for making that and um, hope that the nose continues to heal well and that it continues to improve. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe because we have a lot more great videos coming up. So subscribe, put your notifications on. Loving the comments that I'm seeing from you guys. Thank you so much for the support.